This is Star Talk. Neil deGrasse Tyson here, your personal astrophysicist. And today's show is going to be things you thought you knew. And old timers out there know there's only one person I do that with, and that's Chuck. Chuck Nice. Yes. All Always right. good to have you, man. Always a pleasure to be here. All right. Here. So you ready to have things you thought you knew explained? Yes, because we could do millions of these. If the criteria is, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you get you future proofed this. T- <laughs> That's right. <laughs> there will be no shortage of topics, my friend. <laughs> All right, let's let's get to this. I occasionally get questions about the naming of things in my field. All right, and. Uh, let's take, for example, the names of the moon, the of planets and their moons. All right. And h- had you ever wondered how we get these names? Not really, but I, I mean, I figured somebody looked up and said, I'm going to call it that. <laughs> <laughs> because somebody I mean, if, did it. Right. Because for me, it would have been like, you know, Jupiter and then Jupiter A, B, C, D. <laughs> You know, Jupiter 1, Jupiter 2, Jupiter, like, yeah. you know. That's because you have no imagination. Right. There. It, well, that goes so, without saying. So here we go. So the planets are named, uh, they all have Roman Latin names, basically. Okay. And so they're named after sort of Roman gods. You know, Mercury, you know, the messenger god. Mercury is the fastest moving planet. Venus is quite beautiful in the evening sky. Um, that object got named for Venus, the goddess of love and beauty. Um, and then also in the sky, we have Mars, which is red, the color of blood. So the warrior god got uh, named after war. that planet. Or that planet got named after the warrior god. And let's keep going. You have Jupiter, um, Saturn. On the base, and those, on the are the plan- those are the planets known to the ancients. And then later would be discovered Neptune, uh, Uranus and Neptune. Right, and the thing about Uranus was, both down it was under. the first. <laughs> it was the first time anyone discovered a planet. It was William Herschel, back in the okay. in the seventeen hundreds, and it was like all the other planets were just known because they're just in the sky. There's not the person who discovered them. Anyone who looked up noticed them. So no one is on record for discovering Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, or Saturn. But Uranus got discovered, and it got discovered by William Herschel. And no one had discovered, and therefore no one had actually named a planet in modern times. Wow, he and picked so he, a good one. He, he tried to figure out what to name it. Mm-hmm. And so, so he did the right thing, okay? He named it after his principal funder. <laughs> That's what scientists do. <laughs> wow. Our artists do the same thing. They draw in the, in the, in the background the, the the benefactor or whatever you know the sponsor of right. the painting this it makes the, the rich folks feel good right so uh, so he he named this new star after king george okay all right no, that's the king george that's of the american revolution that same king george because this is the late 18 the late, late 1700s and so, so that's the same george that john hancock signed his big signature large enough for him to read the and same so, George in, the, in Hamilton? That same George, that, that correct. Same, oh. That same King George. So, Who, by the way, that King George, God, could he was a show stealer. <laughs> <laughs> he was good. <laughs> so I have books from that period. So late 1700s, early 1800s, where the, the enumeration of planets is very clear. It's, and we know Earth is a planet, right? So it's Mercury, Venus, Earth. That since Copernicus, we knew that Earth is a planet as an object that goes around the sun. So we have Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. George. And George. George. (laughs) Of course. And George. Right. I have books that list the planets in that order with those names. And this was, you look back and say, what the, what, what, what? You know, and yeah. so, so <laughs> God, we should have left that. Oh. <laughs> I'm telling you right now, that would be the best thing in the world. One day 
we are going to get to George. <laughs> With our greatest of technologies. With our greatest of technology. We shall one day set foot upon George. <laughs> So, so, so or he, we could have just, instead of Uranus, I'm sorry, Uranus, we could have went with George's ass. <laughs> planet, oh my, oh, planet George's ass. <laughs> you gotta say it with a British accent, right? And, exactly. And, planet George's ass. Mm. <laughs> Arse, I'm sorry. I'm so terribly sorry. <laughs> I say, one day we shall get to George's arse. I say. I say. Old chap. Oh, boy. One day we'll get there. So looking forward to being firmly planted in George's ass. <laughs> okay, stop. That's All enough. Right. Okay. I... <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no, 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 no. Okay. Okay, so it would take a little while, but clearer heads would prevail. And how do you tell the discoverer of a planet that he has to unname it after his king? This is very tentative, you know, diplomatic moments here. And so finally we landed on Uranus, Uranus, which from what I have read is similarly pronounced in, um, in both Greek and, and, and Latin, in, in Roman, um, uh, it, they, it's the same word, all right? So it's actually a crossover name between the, the Roman and the Greek, okay? That's cool. Uh, so that, I'll show up later in a minute. So, so, and after that, we get to Neptune. That is a, you know, Roman god of the seas and this sort of right. thing. And then when Pluto was discovered, when everyone believed it was a planet, the, um, Pluto is the god of the underworld and it's Roman. So right. there you have it. All right, so you might say, well, what about the Greeks? In the Western traditions, they were pretty significant in what they contributed to all of this. It's not yeah. just the Romans. Right. Romans are like Johnny come lately compared to the Greeks. Yeah. And so we said, okay, in our Western astronomical traditions, we will honor not only the Romans with planet names, we will honor the Greeks with moon names. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. There we go. So all mm. moons... Essentially, I, there's some exceptions here I can get to. All moons in the solar system are named after Greek characters in the life of the Greek counterpart to the Roman god after whom the planet is named. Gotcha. That's, are you with me on that? I'm with you on that. So basically, you take the Roman, all right, you find a god... And then you say, okay, how does that translate into a Greek god? And now we got a name for a moon. No. I mean, no. right. Go no, ahead. no, 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 no. You, you, got, you, got, you got almost all of it. Almost. Okay. So you got the Roman god. Right. Ask, what is the Greek god counterpart to that Roman god? Okay. Now you look at characters in the life of the Greek god. Ah, gotcha. So and you those are the and, names of the moons. Right, because otherwise you would end up with just two gods. Two on gods and with two sides different- sides of the coin. Right. And yeah, who but, is the but lesser, one would be a planet, can... one would be a moon, and that wouldn't right. be right. That wouldn't be right. Yeah, you'd right. be pissing off some powerful god. Right. Yes, exactly. So let me give you a list of some of these moons. Okay. Mercury doesn't have any moons, and uh, neither does Venus, okay? And let's skip over Earth for a moment. We'll get back to Earth. So what's next? Mars. Mars has two moons, and they're they're pretty sorry moons. Just they're, they're like a dozen miles across. They're oh. not even spherical. Oh, they're, they're embarrassments. Basically, they really are. Yeah, people wondering whether they've just captured asteroids. I was going to say that sounds like a rock. That just yeah, it sounds, it's a rock. <laughs> that doesn't really sound like a moon. It sounds like a rock that got lost. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a wayward rock. A wayward rock. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> lost their rocks. Exactly. <laughs> so, so the Martian moons are called Phobos and Deimos. Phobos and Deimos. Yes, Phobos and Deimos. As I have read in the in the in the Greek traditions, that's the name of the each of the two horses that drives the chariot of Mars across the sky. I got you, Phobos and Deimos. Yes. Which, by the way, 
Demos is a really cool name. So. Demos, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's t- it totally waste, is. Wasted on a rock, I got to tell you. <laughs> it is. <laughs> as cool of a name as Demos is, you wasted it on a rock. Yeah, it looks like an Idaho potato. It's embarrassing. Yeah. Uh, it's embarrassing. But it's all it's got. So, in fact, uh, one of the uh, Mars rovers, I forgot which, was in the path of a Phobos or Demo, a, a Phobos eclipse, right? And so, so, so it's got a picture of Phobos passing in front of the sun. And it's just this outline of an Idaho potato deep within the full disk of the sun. It's embarrassing. Yeah, that is. It yeah. was like, it couldn't even cover the whole sun because it's so little. And it's not even round. So anyway, let's keep going. So what comes after Mars? We get to Jupiter. Uh-huh. So uh, Jupiter, it's four brightest moons were named, they're called the Galilean moons. Galileo first saw them through his telescope and then described them. But this is, uh, let me remember, we have Io, Ganymede, Callisto, and I forgot one. Uh, Callisto, Ganymede, Io, and... Don't look at me. (laughs) I hope you're not helping me. Help help a brother out, Yeah, I hope you're not waiting for me to jump in. You, once you got past Ganymede, I was just like, oh, shoot. <laughs> How could I forget Europa? My gosh. Right. Which exactly. was the star of the movie 2010. So um, uh, Io, Callisto, Ganymede, and Europa. Those are the four biggest moons of Jupiter's, I lost count, is probably near somewhere around 100 moons or more. Because yeah. every time we get closer to it, we see other tiny little rocks. And what distinguishes a moon from just like a not moon? You know, if it's just right. if it's orbiting and it's bigger than a dust particle, is right. it a moon? Can you be in moon no matter how little you are? This right. is a debate, and I'm not going to bring that up here. But I'm just going to say those are the four big ones, and those are the ones that kind of really matter. When you, when you see Jupiter through a telescope, there they are. Okay? Nice. And there's four of them, and they, just, they go around Jupiter. And Galileo, when he first saw them, he said, oh, there's stars near Jupiter. And then he looked later on, and he said, wait, the stars have mooned, moved. He called them the, Gal- the, 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 the Jupiter stars, right? And because wh- why would you think you're discovering a moon? This right. isn't, wh- you, you're coming out of, out of nowhere and landing on this information. And so he was able to see that they moved around. They orbited Jupiter. Oh right. my gosh. That meant the s- Earth was not the center of all motion. Look at that, yeah. This, this was devastating to people who wished it were otherwise. And the Jupiter Stars sounds like a really bad basketball team. <laughs> the Jupiter Stars. <laughs> really, it does. <clears throat> it was, it's a bad any kind of team, right? Yes, exactly. Bad yeah. soccer team. Right? right. So now let me take you to Uranus. Right. Okay. There was a pact. So as not to piss off the Brits, who were very powerful in the late eight, the 1700s. Okay. All right. They're one of the most powerful forces the world had ever seen, particularly with their naval power. Okay. So, are you going to piss off the Brits and King George? What are you going to do? So here's what they did. Here's what they did. We said, okay, we will make an exception of the Greek rule for the planet Uranus. And we will name the moons of Uranus after fictional characters in the plays of Shakespeare. Oh, okay. I have never heard this. That's ever. That's, so this threw a bone back to the Brits so that they could rest easily that their king was stripped from the name of the planet and it, had, and it became a, a Roman god. Consul- uh, wait a minute. A constellation prize. No. Oh, oh God. <laughs> Oh, Chuck, yeah. that was good, Chuck, that was good. I, I, I sailed back. <laughs> I, I got to hand it to you. So, what are some names? We have Portia, P-O-R-T-I-A. Remember Portia oh, from Portia. your Shakespeare? Okay. Um, there are a lot of characters from A Midsummer's Night Dream because that's a very, quite a fantastical storytelling going on there. Uh, among the moon names, we have uh, Umbriel, okay, Titania, Miranda. Miranda is the lead character in The Tempest. Uh, we have... Ariel, Oberon, all right, so Puck, oh. Puck, Desdemona, all, 
all these moons have names drawn from Shakespeare. No, that is, I mean, that is really stunning. Because, I mean, I can't believe that that's just something that everybody should know. Because it's so, like, almost, it feels so random. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a little bit of history. It's, a, yeah, it's it fun is. history. It's, it's not no. science so much as it is just, it, it's no. the intersection of science taking place embedded in our culture. Yeah. Yeah. So, so now you go out to the outer planets. By the way, Pluto, the first moon was discovered around Pluto. It was named uh, Sharon, or I think in the Greek is Karen. Uh, and Karen is the ferry boat driver who carries your soul across the river Styx to Hades. Makes sense. Pluto, god of the underworld. Well, yeah, it's, but it's Hades. That's right. the... So you go to the Greek side of that. So right. make a, a long story short. So this is the, the, the origin stories of the names of the moons. And in the very later years, when there are many more moons discovered and you run out of ca incidental characters in the life of Greek and Roman um, gods. By the way, we had many because they led complex and interesting social lives, right? So there's a lot of characters you could draw from. But in modern times, a more inclusive sensibility has descended upon us, and so now there are there are there are names of of of, of gods and other um, uh, other spiritual beings, fictional beings in from other cultures, not just Greek and Roman. When we fully flush out all the names of all the moons, so that's a that's a that's that's solar system moons one hundred and one, Chuck. Oh man, that's. I'm telling you, that was really cool. Uh, however, from now on, I'm sorry. I, I have to call Uranus George's ass. <laughs> it's Chuck. That's, that's it. Chuck, we got to take a quick break. But when we come back, guess what? I have more explaining to do. Excellent. <laughs> All right. When Star Talk returns. Chuck, we're back. Yes. We're going to take a look at the moon. Okay. We, we looked at the moon a lot lately, but, the, but we're not done. All right. Good. I'm not finished with it. Okay. Can, can you handle it? Oh, yes. No. I don't know. <laughs> right. The moon is so mysterious for so many people for so many reasons. And it's so, I mean, and it's so romantic. Yes. It's, and, almost, you know, every, it's all of the above. It's spooky yeah, and romantic. It's, it's spooky, romantic. It's poetic in many respects. Yes. Yes. You know? Yes. It's in so many paintings, like, you know. Yeah, it's, and and it's 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 a it's a fundamental part of the symbol for Islam. Is the crescent moon with crescent with, moon. with Venus in the sky next right. to it? So yeah, the moon is important. Yeah, and very much. So a couple of things. Uh, there's an old saying. I did not know that was Venus. In well, that flight, okay, in it's that, it's an that. evening or morning star. Right. And Which would if, be if it's bright enough, it's generally going to be Venus. Venus, right? But the um, it's it's rare that there's another really cool star next to it, and Venus is always in the sky, yeah. either with the waning crescent or the waxing crescent. So yes. typically, that's Venus. In practice, yeah. it's Venus. And by yeah. the way, it's really cool to see it when it's a certain time of night, and it really isn't quite like all the way dark, and it's so it's, it's bright. called twilight, Chuck. Oh, use the that, word. No. <laughs> <laughs> what do you call it when it's night but not quite dark? <laughs> Did I just invent something? <laughs> oh my. And you know, there's this stuff around us at all times that, you know, it goes in your lungs and you push it out. <laughs> <laughs> and that big yellow ball that gives us light. Good. That thing. Chuck, I'm so glad you woke up today. Yes. <laughs> out of your 40 year coma. Yes, oh that's what God. you did. Yes, but Twilight, uh, Venus at Twilight is, I mean, it's, and, and you can see it with the naked eye and it's like, it l really looks like somebody turned on a light in the sky. It's really yeah, nice. yeah, and and a little known fact because Venus orbits the sun closer than we orbit the sun. Okay. Venus will never stray too far away from wherever the sun is on the sky. It's uh, not going to end up behind us with the sun in front of us. Right. It's going to be near the sun. So that's why you'll typically notice Venus just after sunset. In twilight, right. we're just before sunrise. Gotcha. And so in, in evening twilight, so dusk. Right. And then the, the poetic other side of that would be dawn. Right. Cool. Yeah. Okay. So that's the crescent moon. That, that's cool. So more about the moon. 
uh, all evidence suggests and all theoretical understanding of the formation of the moon, helped, by the way, by rocks we brought back from, by the Apollo program Sweet. to study and look at, we get a sense of the origin of that place. Do you guys remember that? That's why America was great. <laughs> when we did stuff, you know, because we didn't mind our tax dollars being used to make us the greatest nation on earth. Merkin. I'm just saying, Merkin, yeah. You know, but go ahead. So, <laughs> so we brought back rocks, and we and we were able to yes analyze them and the realize that the moon doesn't have much iron in it. Okay. And a, an object that size should have much more iron in it than it does. So how do you make a whole object that has hardly any iron? So you make it out of a out of a collision with Earth, but it sideswipes Earth after Earth has already sunk its iron to its core. Right. So, so that, when Earth was molten, heavy stuff falls to the middle, light stuff floats to the top. Gotcha. Compared to iron, rocks are light. So all the rocks floated and the iron sunk. Iron, nickel, gold, cadmium, all the, the heavy elements. They're down there in the core. Okay, right. so now Earth has pre-sifted the elements. Pre-sifted. Now you have a, a Mars-sized impactor that sideswipes the Earth, scattering Earth's crust into a ring around the Earth. That Mars-sized impactor keeps going, but the debris mess that it left continues to orbit the Earth. And the slightly larger bits of this have more gravity than the slightly smaller bits, so they'll attract more objects and they get bigger. And as they get bigger, they have even more gravity and they get even bigger and bigger, and it's a runaway exponential growth. The big get bit bigger and the little ones get eaten. Eaten. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> we think over not much time, a matter of months, if not only just a few years, Earth had a ring, not much unlike not mu not unlike, unlike Saturn, Saturn, and that ring coalesced into the moon. And that moon was twenty times closer in the sky than it is today. Oh wow. Well, that must have looked beautiful. Yeah, so imagine that. Just imagine that. It's 20 times wider. Imagine yeah. like Moonrise. It was like... Yeah, that's, that's very Star Wars, you know? Like <laughs> you're standing there in the desert and you see like, you know, a giant a boar in the sky. And you need music sky. to go with that. And that exactly. would just totally complete the scene. Yeah. So it turns out tidal forces are very sensitive to distance, very sensitive. In other words, not emotionally sensitive, but if you change the distance by a little bit, it'll have a much bigger effect than you'd otherwise think on the strength of the tides. Okay, now I can't get over thinking about emotionally sensitive tidal <laughs> forces, <laughs> where all of our oceans are just like, where you go? <laughs> what did I do? <laughs> what did I do? You said did, it's you, it's not me, but I know. Did I deserve you. this? Why did, right. <laughs> you just gonna throw away everything we have <laughs> as you slowly drift away. <laughs> You're so distant. I don't understand <laughs> why we don't communicate anymore. You're so distant. <laughs> All we have to do is talk. Why are you so distant? <laughs> There's, There's a space between us. Exactly. <laughs> I don't know how to fill this chasm between us. <laughs> I can't do all the work here, okay? <laughs> I'm Earth, and I can't do all the work. Chuck, how many hours of therapy have you been in with your wife? <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> By the way, I'm the one saying that in therapy, not her. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 here, so, Mathematically, because you can be mathematically sensitive, okay? I just want to broaden your use of the term sensitivity. So the moon, uh, the, the, the mathematical sensitivity of tidal forces goes as the cube of the distance. Oh, sweet. Okay. So in other words, if it just went as the distance, okay, if it was like 20 times closer, then the tides would be like 20 times higher than they are today. But no. Does it go as the distance squared? That would mean the tides would be 20 times 20 higher than, 
than today. What's 20 times 20? Oh, I don't know, 400? <laughs> Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you pull out a calculator. You on this show, you're Hold gonna on. tell me what 20 times 20 is. Let me see. Hold on. <laughs> no, I'm not doing it. <laughs> okay, so. you got 400. However, tidal forces go as the cube of the distance. So the cube is, it, you multiply by itself three 20 times. By so 20, by 20, 20 times 20, that's 400, mm -hmm. times another 20. <clears throat> So right. 400 times 20, that gets you 8,000. 8, so the tides, the oceanic tides on Earth raised by the moon when the moon first formed were 8,000 times higher wow. than they are today. Look at that. And, 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 and look at that. We're trying to get back there with, with global warming. That's wonderful. <laughs> That's a different problem. <laughs> yeah, tell me about okay, it. Okay, so now watch what happens. Tides sloshing on and off the shores, there's friction between the solid earth and the moving water. Okay. And so earth's rotation back then was actually faster than it is today. All right. Depending on how far back you, you go, you get like an 18, 20 hour day for earth, not 24 wow. hours. Look at that. Okay. So we have a big moon, higher tides, faster rotating Earth. But the tides are so ferocious, Earth is slowing down oh, man. because of it. And in response, the moon's orbit is increasing. It is spiraling away from the Earth. Cool. And it has been doing that ever since. We still have sloshing of tides on the shores. Right. Earth's rotation rate is still slowing down. The moon is still spiraling away from the the earth, but much slower than it once was. Mm -hmm. Why are you killing me softly? If you want to <laughs> leave, just leave. I don't understand it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way, we had tidal influence on the moon. Okay. The moon at one time rotated like anybody else in the, in the, in the solar system. You'd see the front side, the back side, the left side, the right side. But our tidal forces on the moon slowed its rotation down until we locked it. We locked the moon's rotation around the Earth. That's why I'm leaving. Because, <laughs> see, you only see one side of me. I'm a complex person. <laughs> but it seems like, you know, when we're together, I can only show you one face. <laughs> Check. I... This sounds like a TV series. <laughs> Well, then go then. Uh, Why don't you just go? Why must you make it so torturous? I, I've been drifting from you for so, all these years. Exactly. You didn't feel me drifting away? I mean, seriously. Chuck, you can't make a whole, a whole psychological oh relationship out of this. And you know what this show is called? As the World Turns. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. It would be I'm authentically. It would be the best name the show best there ever was. Ever. <laughs> okay. Oh, God. That may be the stupidest thing I've ever done on this show. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Okay. So, so the point is, we tidally locked the moon because we have stronger tides on the moon than the moon has on us. Right. And so, moon just got locked. We slow down its rotation, locked in on it. It only shows one face to us. That's and the other face we've never seen until we orbited it with spacecraft. The moon is trying to do the same thing to us. It wants to slow us down so much that we only show one face to the moon. And the day that happens, we will be in what's called a double tidal lock. Nice. Excellent. There you go. That's a nice dance. I like it. Yeah, yeah. So that's, so that's what it looks like, Chuck. Hey, man, that, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> that's not moon lore. That's just that's, sort of moon facts. Hey, listen, that is, that is awesome. I mean, <laughs> at the moon and the earth uh, locked in a dance. So I have to repeat my one perfect sentence that I've ever written in my life. Okay. May I repeat it for you? Please. Okay. The rotating planets orbit the sun like pirouetting dancers in a cosmic ballet 
choreographed by the forces of gravity. Wow. Damn. <laughs> oh, you wrote that. That's yeah. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, All right, Chuck, we got to end it there. Okay. Enough of uh, them. We'll give the moon a rest, okay? <laughs> okay. And the Earth Moon family. <laughs> exactly. We'll, we'll lead them to their drama. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Chuck, we got to take a quick break, but when we come back, some of the explaining I'm going to do is going to pick up on an earlier explainer video on constellations, but I only just scratched the surface. Way more to come. Okay. Stay with us. We're back, Chuck. Yes. We're gonna be talking about things you thought you knew about the night sky, the constellations. Mm. We're gonna pick up where we left off because okay. I wasn't done with you. Awesome. Let's see if you learned anything from the first session. How many constellations are there? Oh God, 48. Oh, Did I get it? No. Chuck, I said, what? There are as many constellations as there are keys on a piano. Oh, that's right. 88. I got half of it, right? No, I got Teddy, the don't, that's not I how that works. Eight. <laughs> I got the eight, right? <laughs> if we're going to the moon and the engineer says, I got half of it, right? Oh, that's not... <laughs> well, you got there. I mean, you're as not you float coming out back. in space, missing right. your target. You're not coming back. I got half of it, right? <laughs> All right. So we said some cool things, I think, that yes. of Southern Hemisphere constellations known to indigenous people from the Southern Hemisphere, right. would be later discovered by Europeans. And when they named it, they, had or, they were already deep into the industrial revolution. And they so named them they started naming them not after equipment. mythical, magical creatures, but after like stuff that was enabling the emergence of a new kind of brand, a new- Like sextant. Another level of civilization. There's right. a sextant. By the way, before the sextant was invented, which was 60 degrees of a circle, right. okay? There's six of those, six times 60 is 360 degrees. What preceded that was an octant. Wow. Okay, that was an eighth of 360 degrees. The sky has a sextant and an octant in it. Very nice. That feels a little excessive to me, all right? You know, be happy with one, but no, you want two. Two out of the 88 constellations are navigational devices that are kind of the same, you, you know? You never have too many tools, you know? <laughs> That's true, okay. You can never. Can't over right. anything. So a couple of things. Um, what's, in your mind, the most famous constellation in the Southern Hemisphere? Oh, in the Southern? God. See, so what I was going to say, but that's not Southern, was Big Dipper, but everybody knows that. Yeah, that's the North. Yeah. That's the yeah. North. Okay. Yeah, in you're the Southern Hemisphere. 8,000 miles off. I know. Um, <laughs> I said it was in the North. No, nine um, out of 10 people say the Southern Cross. I was about to say the cross. You yeah. do, you would not. No I really was. That. No, let me tell you something. I really was about to say the cross, but I was scared to do so because one night we were sitting out and you had your, you know, top secret uh, sky pointer. Government issue. And you were, and you, but there's a cross in the north too. Yeah. That you would, and so that's why I, would, I was about to say cross, but. Okay, so there's a northern confused. cross, which we love here in the northern hemisphere, and there's a southern cross. But they're really different from each other. Okay. The Southern Cross is embarrassing compared to the Northern Cross. Oh, no. Okay. The oh, Southern funny. Cross has four stars in it. Okay. It's in the shape of a rhombus. Uh, there is no star there's, there's no, there's at no the cross. transept. Right. Yeah. So you could have just drawn a rhombus to remind people from eighth grade geometry. A rhombus is like, take a perfect square, sit on it, distort the sides, and then you get a rhombus, okay? So it is a stretch to call the Southern Cross a cross. It's a stretch. I'm just telling you. Wow. Not only that, of all 88 constellations, the Southern Cross is the smallest. Oh. Your thumbnail at arm's reach would completely cover all four stars of the Southern Cross. Oh. It is one of the biggest marketing delusions there ever was. And isn't I mean, there a Crosby Stills uh, song? Crosby, Nat, um, Crosby Stills the and Southern Nash? Cross. Oh, uh, that's okay. the only line I know of it because it has uh, okay, astronomical. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't know this song at all, but. <laughs> well, they didn't sing that in the hood. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, CSR, that's, uh, you know, it's a little <laughs> Caucasian for me. I'm just saying. <laughs> I mean, don't so, get me wrong, but I, you know. So this, I just want to put put it out there with the Southern Cross. Now, 
Have you ever met people who have visited the Southern Hemisphere anywhere, be it Africa or Australia? Right. And, and they come back and what do they tell you about the sky? Uh, I, you know, I never really got into it. Never got into it. I normally ask them about the place they okay. were. See, that's, that's How's how the clubs? They, How's the... Yeah, exactly. You know, <laughs> tell me about the food. What did you see? You know, okay. only you would be like, and so the night sky. Yeah, tell I'm me, sorry. I'm a little biased Tell me about here. that night sky. <laughs> what happens is people visit the Southern Hemisphere and they come back and they say, the Southern Hemisphere, hemisphere sky is so beautiful. Yeah. It is so amazing. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. And... And so there's another little delusion going on there as well. And what is that? I don't want to stop you from liking the Southern Hemisphere sky better than the North. I, I have no problems with that. But there are forces operating that contaminate your data. Okay? Okay. Do you know how much of Earth's land is in the Southern Hemisphere? Um, I would say not a lot. Not a lot. About. I mean, when you look at Africa, it's like, that's most of it. Yes, okay. <laughs> About 15% of Earth's land mass is south of the equator. Okay. Yep. That's also about 15% of Earth's population. Oh. Okay. So hardly anybody lives in the Southern Hemisphere. Right. So there's hardly any city lights. Hardly any light pollution, air pollution, all the things that subtract away from our experience embracing the sky in the north does not block your view in the south. So people think the actual sky is better because they can see it better. Wow. So I'm telling you that the north has all the coolest constellations. All right, you know, with the Big Dipper and the, you know, and the Little Dipper and the, you know, and 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 Cassiopeia. Some constellations straddle the North and the South. Orion is half in the North and half in the South. But when we look at him, he's right side up. If you want to see Orion in the Southern Hemisphere, he's upside down. That there's that's, there's no excuse for that. So I'm just I'm a Northern chauvinist here, but I think I have good reason for it. Yeah, but the the problem is we can't see it. So. <laughs> Okay. I mean, you can be as hot as you want, you know, but if you're walking around in a burlap sack, <laughs> nobody's going to know. What nobody you... knows how hot you are. Wow. We so, get rid of, yeah. So this, this is an like interesting you. fact about it. Now, here's a so the Northern Cross is much bigger than the Southern Cross. And there's a star in the transept for yes, it. Right. OK, it's called, <laughs> and that's an asterism. An asterism is a set of stars that is the more interesting subset of all the stars that comprise the constellation. Sweet. So, the Northern Cross is Cygnus the Swan, the constellation, which is not only those stars in the cross, but there are other stars where you can imagine wings, and it's flying long neck, neck swan along the Milky Way. So it's a beautiful thought that there's a swan doing this, but it's bluntly a cross. Right. Now, last thing I'll tell you. There's more, but I just want to sort of put it out there. Um, many of the star, uh, star constellations are all Greek and some latter-day technologically related ones. But some of the earliest navigators were the Arabs, okay? The entire Arabian Peninsula, all those folks, there are very few clouds because it's desert. And so you saw the night sky and you want to get around. There's no monuments. There's no GPS. There are no mile markers. How are you going to get around? So they pioneered astrolabes, which was their version of the European sextant, okay, and the octant. But the astrolabe, they did it first, and, and it beautiful works of art with rotating dials, and you hold it up, and you can get the angle, and, you, and there are tables and charts. It's magnificent, all etched in brass, beautiful. We have a collection at the American Museum of Natural History, but one of the largest collections in the world is at the Adler Planetarium and Astronomy Museum in Chicago. They nice. have one of the largest collections of astrolabes in the world. Anyhow, point is, as an homage to the Arabic role in navigating the sky, two-thirds of all stars in the sky that have names have Arabic names. Oh, wow. This is part of the sort of inclusiveness of my field, where if you contributed to it, we're not going to forget you. And, and by the way, in the constellation Libra, 
the scales. Um, the two brightest stars in that constellation are Arabic names. One of them is Zubin el Janubi, and the other is Zubin es Shamali. Okay. Those are the two longest star names of all named stars in the sky. And what is the abbreviation for pound? LBS. LB. You know what LB stands for? Uh, uh, I, no, I don't. Libra. <laughs> the scales. It just okay. gets worse. <laughs> First, you go from pounds to LB. Right, right. <laughs> and, it's, it's, and LB is a short and, for Libra, the scales. Libra. Right. The measurement of things. That's so cool. All right, Chuck, we got to call it quits. Okay. Have you had enough things you thought you knew I explained to you? I never get enough of explaining, okay? There's things I thought I knew, and I'm like, I thought I knew, but I didn't know. Yeah, Look and the stuff that. you didn't know that you thought you knew it. it exactly. That, that counts. I, I didn't know. I thought I knew this, and now I know that I do. <laughs> and then there's some stuff that I didn't want to know at all, and I, <laughs> and I still know it now. <laughs> Occasionally, you have to know stuff that you didn't want to know at all. Ex that that absolutely. happens in life. That's right. And that'll happen here on Things You Thought You Knew. <laughs> Always good to have you, Chuck. Always. This has been Star Talk, a Things You Thought You Knew edition. Neil deGrasse Tyson here. People think.